Welcome to Astronomy for Everyone. I'm Steve Woody. I'm your host for this month. And with me in the studio this month is Bob Trembley, and he will be going over the Kerbal Space Program. Welcome, Bob. Hi there. As uh, Steve said, I'm, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm the outreach officer for the Warren Astronomical Society and a volunteer NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador. So in a nutshell, what is the Kerbal Space Program? Okay, Kerbal Space Program is an award-winning uh, application. It runs on the PC, Mac, Linux, Xbox, and PS4. Uh, it allows you to build rockets, Lego so, style. So this is a video game it's, that, that essentially... It's marketed as a game, but it's a simulator. It's kind of like crossed the threshold. Sort of like Sim Earth or Sim City or something. Mm, kind of. Uh, it's yeah. got a very accurate physics model. And here it, it lets you build rockets. You click them together, Lego style. You drag them from a large uh, group of parts and you just slap them together. Put them on a launch pad, and you can then launch them and get them into space. And you can build space planes, too. Now here, we, here we see a uh, picture of an orbital diagram. This is after one that's got into space and uh, done a stage separation. Here we see a probe uh, scanning the planet from orbit. It's got a whole bunch of different parts to do that with. <coughs> you can um, perform orbital maneuvers. Uh, the, uh, the movie The Martian actually mentioned this. This is the Holman transfer. And uh, it's funny, I mentioned to my wife when we went and saw The Martian in the theater, uh, they mentioned the Holman transfer, and I said to her, I did one of those this morning. But, <laughs> it's a great movie. Yeah, this, but yeah, it lets you do that, and you can go into orbit around the moon, and you can land on the moon and perform science from its surface. And you can use those same orbital maneuver uh, procedures to transfer to other planets and... You can explore them with robotics probe. This is actually a screenshot of mine at the bottom there. Um, you can land on planets and moons or, or, or crash. There's a lot of crashing involved. And here's an example of all the different science parts. These are some of the stock and some that came with mods, but it allows you to you know, measure temperature, pressure, gravity, um, all sorts of things like that. You can build gigantic rockets and launch them into space. And you can build space stations and link them using orbital rendezvous and docking procedures. You can perform science at your space station, re-enter. Enter and bring them back home. Re-entry is a lot of fun. You can build those space stations around uh, the moon or other planets or their moons. And you can uh, launch space telescopes, and this one looks suspiciously like the James Webb Space Telescope, which NASA will be launching very soon, and this is, this is included in a, in a mod for the game. Um, the, the application was under development for several years before it was released uh, last April, and, and, uh, in April of 2015, I'm sorry. And uh, it, uh, NASA contacted them and uh, had them include a scenario that replicates their asteroid redirect mission. So this is an in-game scenario. You have to go rendezvous with an asteroid, latch onto it, and move it out of the way for an, an impending impact. Yeah, the uh, Warren Club actually talked to an astronaut who uh, is a trained ge a geologist, Andrew Foistel, who actually comes from Michigan. 
and uh, we got to I got to talk to him a little bit about the asteroid rendezvous mission. You know, would he like to go out and do that and you know chip away at the asteroid with our you know with a with a hammer and chisel? Uh, mm -hmm. And okay. he says he would love to do that. He would just love to. I'm kind of, I'm kind of a fan of sending robots out because of cosmic <laughs> rays, but still. Yeah, but you know, if we're going to learn how to get to Mars, we want to do something well, easier I, first. Well, the big thing is the space industry, and uh, there's a several several things in the game which which lead toward you know, industry in space. You can build um, mines on the moon and, and you know, propellant from processing the mines. But Kerbal Space Program encourages uh, engineering design and experimentation. If, if your rocket messes up or something screws up, you go back to the drawing board and you fix it. Yeah, with, so with no loss of life. So learn by crashing. <laughs> yeah, well, that happens a lot. <laughs> so yeah, it, it, it teaches uh, physics with, with no math at all and, and rocket design in a fun way. It's got several different modes of play, and if you, if you run career mode, you literally have to complete contracts. You know, get this payload into this specific orbit by this amount of time and, 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 and things like that. Um, it and teaches you physics concepts, and uh, the educational version has a whole bunch of widgets which, which go into this in much more detail, but you can, you can learn about lift and, and flight, potential energy, kinetic energy, and, and, and stuff like that. And it's mostly Newton's laws. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No and flights to Mercury? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, the game comes, the stock solar system in the game is not Earth, and it's not the solar system, but it's real close. Yeah. There's a Mercury component. There's so the a, Mercury's orbit is only a little bit uh, perturbed by, uh, uh, by being that deep in the gravity well, so it yeah. only changes a little bit. Yeah. You probably could get away with Newton's, Newton's laws, and uh, well, you know, when you see you're not really quite there yet, you, you go a little longer. <laughs> yeah, 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 and uh, says, so, uh, one of the things uh, uh, the game teaches you um, is an appreciation for um, how long things take. And this image here um, is orbital mechanics. The, the, one of the most important things, I think, that this game teaches you is how orbits form, develop, and change, and what it takes to do plane changes and things like that. The first time I saw my orbit forming after I was going in orbit, it was, it was a smack in the head. It was like, oh, that's what's going on. It was, it was Really amazing. Does it have uh, gravity assists? Oh yes, absolutely. Oh, awesome. you, and and, and one of the, in the Wikipedia it shows you if you do a gravity assist by whipping around the planet from one direction, you increase your speed, and you go around the other direction, you reduce your speed. And yes, you know, gravity assists. Yeah, it's it's cool stuff. And mm -hmm. the space probes have been doing that for years. Oh yeah, decades. But uh, yeah, you can do it in your own home now. <laughs> And uh, so, as an amateur astronomer, uh, one of the things that uh, that that I think is it, that really I really appreciate is it gives you an appreciation for why space missions take forever to get out to their destinations. Because in game, it takes forever. <laughs> it takes a long time, and, and it it really teaches you a lot. So presumably, you can pause. And, oh yeah, you can and, pause. You can time accelerate and, and it go to work or go to school. Well, you know, it doesn't take you 11 years to get out to the gas giant. No, you yeah. can time accelerate. Yeah, be, uh, yeah. <laughs> it would take a while. Yeah. So uh, it teaches you a whole bunch of new and interesting terms. Like this is arrow breaking, which is uh, technically taking your periapsis into the atmosphere and causing atmospheric drag to lower your apoapsis. And if your apoapsis also in, uh, enters the atmosphere, you then uh, are in an atmospheric re-entry. Yeah. <laughs> so lithobraking, this is kind of a, a comedic uh, term for crashing. It's a using a planetary surface, using a planetary lithosphere to slow down your spacecraft Rapidly, and we did have lithobraking used by uh, it was um, it was one of the space probes. It ended up landing in the uh, Utah desert, but it didn't land with the parachute didn't deploy, so it landed way faster. Was that, was that a sample return? It was a sample return. Yeah, um, uh, I'm trying to think. Not Hayabusa. No, no, no. It was uh, the American Stardust. One. Stardust. Uh, yeah, Stardust. That's Yikes. right. That's right. Yeah. So uh, the 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 samples were damaged. And they dealt with it. They, uh, the analysis took years longer, but they did it. It was pretty cool. And uh, in, in the game, uh, in, in, there's a brand new version coming out soon. It's under development right now. And uh, they have a sample return package, which is meant just for that purpose. Okay. 
We're going to take a brief break now, but before we do, I'd like to remind everyone that you can send us comments or questions to our email, which is at the bottom of the screen. And also, if you would like to look at past episodes on YouTube, we have links to all of these shows at the address at the bottom of your screen. And now, uh, Don will show us the term of the month. Thanks, Stephen. Our term of the month this month will actually be images from our Ford Club members. We're going to begin with the moon. This is an excellent shot. It was uh, taken with a Grasshopper 3 camera and an old 4-inch telescope. Now, the telescope was braced against our member's hip while he stood on his front porch and recorded a movie clip onto his laptop. Isn't too bad of an image taken without a tripod. Now, there were some uh, software programs used to uh, process this image. One of them was AutoStacker to stack the uh, 70 images that were captured over the course of a second, and Registack 6 for the actual sharpening of the image that you see. And this picture really shows us the power of modern day imaging software. Because in the old days, you never would have got something that sharp shooting from the hip. Next, we have a, uh, a quick look at two planets, Jupiter and Venus. Uh, this image was taken back on August 27th. And it shows Venus to the uh, upper left there just a little bit. You can see a little thin band of clouds traveling between the two planets. And uh, some post-processing was used for this picture, but not a whole lot. Our next image is of the sun, a little slice here. This was taken with a Lunt hydrogen alpha scope. And in it, you can see some nice flares popping up from the edge. And finally, we're going to close out with this one. This is an image of the Orion Nebula, the constellation of Orion. Uh, it used alignment software and other stacking software programs to gain the sharpness that you see here. And this is just a sampling of some of the images taken by one of our members, Greg Koneklian of the Ford Club. And so with that, back to you, Stephen. Welcome back to Astronomy for Everyone. And we are joined today uh, with Bob Trembley, who is going to continue talking, telling us a little bit about the Kerbal Space Program. OK. Um, yeah, there is an educational version of Kerbal Space Program that's meant for use in the classroom. It uh, has some uh, educational widgets that you can put on the rockets and things like that. And it uh, takes you through the history of the early space race, and you can recreate and fly missions like the X-15 rocket plane, and uh, you can put Sputnik into orbit or Explorer 1, as, as in shown on the picture here. And the uh, thing with Kerbal Space Program is it has a very steep learning curve. It's rocket science. And, uh, and I learned a so, so we expect it to take a while. Well, it shouldn't. You see, if you have somebody who knows it and can show it to you, um, it would probably go a lot faster. And uh, I learned a lot from the in-game uh, training scenarios and YouTube videos. Um, and to address the problem with the learning curve, they, the 1.1 uh, version has this internal uh, uh, Wikipedia, essentially, that goes through all of the controls for how, how the rocket works yeah. and how orbital, uh, orbital maneuver and, and plane changes, how, how that works. And, and uh, it's, they paid someone a lot of money. It is absolutely a fantastic tool. Here's an example of doing plane changes. And, uh, and this is the kind of things that is, is in, in their manual. Well, I know that the teens these days use YouTube for learning just about anything. In fact, my own teens have said, hey, when you're working on your car, why don't you look up the YouTube video? Mm -hmm. And like somebody's got a YouTube video for this part on this model car for this year. And the answer is, yeah, there are five to choose from. Yeah, and there it's are pretty cool. a, a plethora of of YouTube videos uh, covering everything from a, a, a brand new version of a mod has come out, and here I'm showing you all the new parts, and uh, uh, it's just 
speaking of mods, um, there is a huge user community in Kerbal Space Program, and uh, they have designed rocket parts and mods. For instance, here's 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 a mod called MechJeb, which is a uh, autopilot, uh, auto lander, space plane pilot, uh, ascent guidance. It does it does a lot of different things, and uh, this. If you have it, this is just fantastic. Here, this one is uh, Kerbal Engineer. This one tells you, shows you the difference in weight of different uh, uh, stages and the thrust to weight ratio and, and uh, some, some features like that. And you can tell it uh, what, what is that in the atmosphere, out of the atmosphere. And, and I see like cost that. was in there as an engineer. Cost is something that engineers actually work with. If if you're if you're uh, playing the game in career mode, well, the contracts you you get an initial fee and you have a completion fee, and if you fail to complete it, you have a steep penalty. So yeah, it, it there are there are costs when it comes to playing in in, in the career mode. Yeah, it's, so, it's very realistic. So this is the uh, this is the uh, startup screen here, and there's a mod called Environmental Visual Enhancements, which uh, adds um, some flavor to the planets. It adds clouds and things, and volumetric clouds, and it does it to that and the Mars equivalent and the Jupiter equivalent. It can make them look just beautiful. So, so these mods can require more CPU time, better graphics. That's oh sort of yes, you you can you can load hundreds of mods into this game, and it will it will bring your PC to its knees if you we, if you let it. We might take a a, a moment to talk about uh, what sort of a PC you need. You know, if you've well, got your PC. I've got a six-year-old PC with what now Nvidia calls a legacy graphics card, and it's running okay on that, but a, a new system with a modern, fairly good graphics card will run this just fine. you have any idea how much RAM would be a, sort of a minimum? I was running it on 4, 8 was just fine. Really? You were running it on 4? Yeah. 4, it, gigabyte, 4 gigabytes of RAM. That's about the minimum I'd suggest. So if you don't have a video card, if you've got uh, uh, like an Intel chip or a, an AMD chip with the onboard video, or you have uh, just sort of a, a weaker video card, there are ways to make the game run acceptably. You can yes, make the screen can, smaller and so on. You can, you can change the screen size, you can uh, jack the uh, graphics values way down to one, and, and uh, so on. And so on, yes. It will run on older PCs. Here's an example of a mod called Scatter. This adds atmospheric scattering, which just makes the game look beautiful, absolutely beautiful. This is real plume. This uh, makes the rocket's uh, exhaust plumes expand as you get higher up into low pressure environments, like, like it really does. It really looks cool. These are sounding rockets. This is a mod that uh, lets you uh, create very, very small rockets. And uh, we launched some of these, actually, from a location. This is a, a Nike Apache. This was launched from this location in Michigan's Keweenaw Peninsula in the Upper Peninsula. Here, get my map out. Here's, here's Michigan. Way up here. Michigan actually sent a rocket into space in the early 70s from that location. And my wife and I visited uh, the uh, monument for this uh, earlier this summer, and we actually uh, contributed 20 bucks to get that uh, erected in, in 2000. Uh, Michigan put a rocket into space. There's another mod called Asteroid Day, which was developed in collaboration with the B612 Foundation, and it includes an infrared asteroid hunting space telescope and missions to find and catalog asteroids. I can hardly wait for this mission to go on whenever it goes on up. No, this, this, this is... Uh, it's, it's this. Uh, this this is the Sentinel mission. This is the B612 Foundation's privately funded uh, asteroid hunting, and it, it's uh, supposed to go up in a couple years. Yeah. So you and I can contribute. Can could contribute yes. to that. Sure. Yes. Yeah. This is uh, this is a mod that adds a whole bunch of different science parts. You've got a magnetometer boom here. You've got uh, solar particle collectors, uh, surface samplers. Just just an absolute ton of different uh, science equipment that you can add on to your landers and, and spacecraft. This uh, the Space Y mod adds gigantic engines and gigantic fuel tanks to, to make huge rockets. And uh, this is pretty interesting. In 2015, uh, the European Space Agency challenged uh, college students from around the world to come up with scenarios for low lunar orbit and lunar surface operations. 
and uh, they uh, allowed them to use several different packages to, uh, to model this, including CATIA and Kerbal Space Program, Blender, and the winning team uh, used Kerbal Space Program uh, to model this. And uh, it, hundreds of students from around the world participated in this program, and I would like to see uh, students from Michigan or throughout the U.S. I, I want them to experience this. Really, from the world, but yes, yeah. But what 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 you have access to is Michigan. Yes. Well, I have to start somewhere. <laughs> yeah, we all have to start somewhere. But um, I, I found this on online on Twitter in February, and this is an after-school club uh, that's doing pretty much exactly what I want to do. They're running Kerbal Space Program in a middle school, and this is my wife's school. My wife and I are running. An after-school club. As a matter of fact, we had the second session today. We've loaded up Kerbal Space Program, NASA Eyes on the Solar System, Stellarium, Stellaria, Celestia, um, and just a whole bunch of things. And I'm going to be having the kids recreate and fly missions from the early space era. And here's an example of a space probe in orbit around the planet. And here's a moon flyby. And this is the kind of things my students are going to be doing. It sounds really cool. It is. It's really cool. It must be fun to play with. It is. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, that's pretty much uh, our, our show. Um, any last words you want to uh, tell our audience? Um, I mean... Fly safe. <laughs> fly safe. <laughs> Let's check out that litho breaking. <laughs> okay, so... And that's, um, uh, that's the main topic. And back to Don for What's Up in the Night Sky. Thanks, Stephen, and welcome to What's Up for October 2016. We'll kick it off with the sunrise and sunset times. On the first, the sun rises at 7.31, but by the uh, end of the month, it doesn't rise until 8.05. The set times on the first, 7.13, and at the end of the month, for our trick-or-treaters, 6.27. Now, for our moon phases for October, our first quarter moon is on the 9th. We shift to full moon when it's visible all evening on the 16th. Third quarter arrives on the 22nd. And new moon is on the 30th, the day before Halloween. Now, the moon is also at perigee on the 16th, the full moon date. This means that the moon will be as close as it gets to the Earth in its orbit. It'll be at apogee, or farthest away, on All Hallows' Eve. Starting with the planets, we come to Mercury. A very elusive planet, difficult to see because it's typically very close to the horizon. It's best seen in the morning, uh, early in the month, uh, about a half an hour before sunrise. And Mercury is at superior conjunction when it will be behind the sun, as seen from here on Earth, on the 27th. Jupiter will also be very difficult to see. Uh, look for it on the 10th of the month near Mercury, and uh, Jupiter is also in conjunction on the 26th, the day before Mercury does the same. Next is Venus. Uh, it's an evening object low in the west at dusk, on the 1st, it sets at 8.22, and on the 21st, it sets at 8.12. Now, it will be at maximum western elongation. Uh, that means its distance from the sun is greatest. Uh, that'll be on the 26th, and so that'll give us our best views of the second planet from the sun. Next, we have Saturn, which will be in the southwest at sunset. On the 1st, it'll set at 10.08 p.m., and on the 31st, setting almost two hours earlier at 8.20. Mars, the red planet, 
also in the southwest and fairly close to Saturn. Uh, also at sunset in the west, uh, it sets on the 1st at 11.17, and on the 21st, it sets at 11.02. Now, the final two planets in our solar system, Uranus and Neptune. Uranus can be found in the constellation of Pisces, the fish. It reaches opposition on the 15th of the month. That means it's opposite in our sky from the sun, and it will be visible all night long. But because Uranus is at the limit of naked eye visibility, optical assistance is strongly advised to view it. Neptune, well, you do need that optical assistance for sure. It is in the constellation of Aquarius. And Pluto, the former planet, now a dwarf planet, can be found in Sagittarius, close to the handle of the teapot asterism in that constellation. Next, we're going to take a look at a view of our solar system as seen from high above. This shows us the positions of the planet's of our neighborhood in space, the solar system, in October. And uh, when looking at it from high above, the planets orbit the sun in a counterclockwise rotation. Want to finish off with talking about a couple of meteor showers that will be happening in October. The first one is the Draconids. Uh, the radiant comes out of the constellation of Draco the Dragon, which is fairly high up in our sky. It winds around the Little Dipper. And what's good about this one is we'll be able to see more meteors early. Typically, meteor showers are best seen after midnight because this is so high in the sky, we can enjoy it much earlier than we otherwise will. The other meteor shower is the Orionids coming out of the constellation of Orion, specifically his club, which is just above his head, kind of leaning over a bit towards the constellation of Gemini. Uh, the peak for that one is the 22nd, and uh, you'll see anywhere from about 10 to 20 an hour. And uh, in case I forgot to mention it, for the Draconids, the peak is October 7th. And that's our look at what's up in the night sky for October. Remember, keep looking up. Thank you.